Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Peel Halton um, Local Employment Planning Council's Small to Medium Enterprise SME Toolbox Webinar Series. Today is the first in our series of six, and it's all about Bill 148. My name is Gail Jacqueline Rogerson. I'm the communication specialist for the Peel Halton Lepke, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we get started, just a few things to note. We really want to hear from you, and we want to ensure that your questions are answered. So be sure to use the question and answer panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar screen and post your questions there. I'll also be taking notes uh, note of any questions that you ask as we go along. For those who have dialed in by phone, um, make sure that you um, select phone, enter your audio PIN in the panel, and to eliminate any echo, um, make sure that uh, all mics are muted. One final note, please ensure that your screen is expanded to maximum mode, and with that, I believe we're ready to begin. I'd like to introduce our feature presenter, award-winning labor and employment lawyer, Laura Williams. Laura is the founder of Williams HR Law and Williams HR Consulting Incorporated. A regular columnist for Profit Magazine and National Post, Laura is committed to helping employers think about people management challenges. Laura has been featured across such media outlets as Globe and Mail, Canadian Lawyer, CBC Radio, Global TV, CTV News, Rogers Daytime and Chatelaine, and that's just to name a few. In addition to her practice, Laura is a member of various professional associations and service organizations. Laura was recently named one of Canada's top female entrepreneurs by Canadian Business Magazine. In 2014, Williams HR Law was awarded York Region Business of the Year and has been a proud corporate sponsor of the HRPA York Region chapter for many years. I'm just going to hand it now over to Laura. Again, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the presentation. Laura? was the Labor Relations Act. And uh, what we're going to cover this morning in the time that we have is uh, the following. What I want to do is discuss with you the background, uh, the, kind of what got us here uh, with respect to the legislators proposing the, uh, the anticipated changes that will be made pursuant to Bill 148. Then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the proposed legislation. We'll review certain of the proposed Bill 148 amendments to the Employment Standards Act and Labor Relations Act. Now, given the time that we have, again, I won't I say here certain of the proposed amendments because we really don't have time to go through all of the amendments that are, are slated to be implemented commencing January 1st. But uh, what I have done is selected certain key amendments that certainly will have some significant impact. Um, then we're going to discuss the implications of the changes on organizations. So essentially what will this mean for your operations? And uh, certainly this will lead to uh, some discussion around some compliance considerations you should bear in mind. So what will you need to do operationally to ensure that you meet the new compliance responsibilities? And then we will leave you with some strategies and best practices to consider um, as you strive to meet your compliance obligations when the legislation uh, commences as of uh, January 1st of the coming year. So first let's talk a little bit about the background. So essentially how do we get here? Many of you who are uh, kind of keep your ear to the ground with respect to what's happening from a, 
uh, kind of legislative standpoint or anything that's kind of hot in the news will have heard of the fact that the, the, um, the, there was a review called the Changing Workplaces Review, which began in 2015. Now, essentially, the Changing Workplaces Review was conducted by two labor and employment arbitrators who had long distinguished careers as lawyers in the field. Um, and essentially, this review was conducted in response to concerns among la labor activists that too many Ontario workers lack job security and basic employment protections. Now, this review culminated in a final report, which, which was issued in uh, May 2016. And essentially, it, it incorporated a number of recommendations, again, intended to improve working conditions and encourage widespread compliance with the law. And the law is, a, again, a focus of the review for the Employment Standards Act as well as the Labor Relations Act. Not more than two weeks after the final report was issued in May, uh, Bill 148 was tabled at first reading. And this was on June 1st, 2017. Um, now, it, it was considered by the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs during the summer of 2017 before the Ontario Legislature re resumed sitting on September 11. There were a number of changes that were made um, from the first reading iteration of the bill, and we're going to be discussing the current version of the legislation today. Um, essentially, you know, the, the amendments, as many of you will know, will apply almost exclusively to provincially regulated employers and those specifically operating in Ontario. And uh, it will, though, from a, from, with respect to the minimum wage increases, you should know, will apply to fe federally regulated employers as, as with provincially regulated employers. Now, I want to focus on the, the specific issues and trends that gave rise to the uh, Changing Workplaces Review and ultimately resulted in Bill 148. So these are the key uh, you'll see on the screen, these are the key issues and trends that were a focus. And you'll see from the statistics here, uh, essentially, about this is what led to the Changing Workplaces Review and Bill 148. And overall, what these show is the, the focus on the rise in precarious employment, um, essentially resulting from more temporary roles, more minimum wage roles, and also less employees having union protections. So the focus of the Bill 148 proposed amendments are intended to provide greater protections to workers to result in, in large measure in uh, less precarious employment. Um, you'll note though, before I move from this slide, that one of the things also, the, the trends that are a focus is the fact that many workers have unpredictable, varied hours of work that create challenges for employees in managing their personal lives. So you'll note when we actually go through a number of the uh, proposed changes that um, a number of them are focused on removing what has customarily been the discretion and flexibility that employers have to, again, provide more predictability um, and less kind of variance in hours that uh, a lot of employees uh, face in their, in their working conditions. Now, with respect to the expected impact of Bill 148, um, you should note that there was a study by the Canadian Center for Economic Analysis of expected economic impacts of Bill 148. Um, this study was commissioned by Keeping Ontario, Keep Ontario Working Coalition, sorry about that, um, and also in partnership with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, as well as other employer and industry associations. Um, now, the findings of the study is that uh, approximately 185,000 jobs will be at risk in the next two years um, if Bill 148 is implemented as it's currently worded. Uh, there will be a $23 billion impact on businesses in the next two years. Now, this is going to be set off by a stimulus of approximately $11 billion, but that still leaves a $12, $12 billion gap. And essentially, the, the other uh, finding was that there would be a 50% increase to the inflation rate. So these aren't small impacts. This is something that this bill um, is, should have the attention of employers uh, operating in Ontario because, again, it will have very serious implications for employers. 
Now, with respect to what we're going to cover, uh, with uh, focusing on the specific uh, Bill 148 proposed amendments, these are the ones I've selected. First one is the increase uh, minimum wage to minimum wage, which has gotten a lot of media attention. And most um, employers uh, and organizations that are live to the fact that Bill 148 is coming down the pike have really only been focusing on the fact that there's going to be an increase to minimum wage. Then there are some, uh, there's a, a further amendment that's proposed as it relates to equal pay for equal work, and I'll get into the details around this proposed uh, amendment. Employee scheduling rights is another scope of amendments, um, increased vacation entitlement, um, expanded leaves of absence, um, entitlements and protections, uh, employee contractor classification, and that's focusing on the fact that um, it's been observed that many uh, relationships are being mischaracterized as not being employee employment relationships when they otherwise should be. Um, then the, the, with respect to the, the proposed changes to the labor relations legislation, uh, there are two that we're going to focus on. There are more than two, but the only two that we're going to focus on for our purposes today is um, how union organizing efforts will be impacted by the fact that um, there, there now is an avenue for unions to gain access to employee lists. And then with respect to remedies that the Labor Board has in the context um, of an unfair labor pr practice, there is a proposed change to remedial certification. So I'll get into the details of all of these proposed Bill 148 changes momentarily. So let's let's dive in. Let's talk about the uh, proposed increase to minimum wage. As I mentioned, this uh, proposed amendment to the Employment Standards Act has gotten the most fanfare out of all of the proposed and slated amendments under Bill 148. In fact, the proposed increase to minimum wage has virtually eclipsed a lot of the other uh, amendments, and which has been unfortunate for employers because they don't understand and they don't have a full appreciation of the fact that there are many more areas um, of the employment landscape that will be impacted by this um, coming legislation. So as it stands, and just to give you a bit of a formula of how I'm going to go through the, the proposed changes, I'm going to walk you through the current landscape or as things stand under the existing legislation, and then we will look at and, and have some discussion around the changes, so what's being proposed to change. So as, as it relates to, to minimum wage, you should note that the current landscape is that general minimum wage uh, currently is 1160 per hour. And then there are other special uh, wage uh, kind of categories that have uh, special rates, such as liquor, liquor servers, and their minimum wage is, is $10.10. .10. Student minimum wage is currently $10.90. Um, there are others, such as home workers, uh, which uh, have a whole separate uh, wage rate level, as well as hunting and fishing guides. There's, there's some special categories, but you should know that the current general minimum wage is 11.60 per hour. Now, before Bill 148, um, the various minimum wage rates have increased annually, and that's in October of each year, in line with the inflation rate. So that's how we've prepped up to um, to 11.60 as it currently stands. Now, what's being proposed under Bill 148? And as of January 1, 2018, minimum wage will be increased to $14 per hour. And then as of January 1, 2019, minimum wage will be increased to $15 per hour. So, and, and the special minimum wage rates will increase proportionally with the general minimum wage rate as, the, as they uh, increase on this phase basis. Now, one, one thing to note, um, and I won't camp here for too long, is that the increase to minimum wage wasn't a, uh, any of, didn't feature in the recommendations under the changing workplace re workplaces review. So uh, there are a lot of uh, conservatives and, and groups representing employers uh, that have been critical of the, uh, the Li Ontario Liberal government that uh, this minimum wage change is being kind of opportunistic and a blatant effort to secure re-election. Um, I'm not going to get on any soapbox in that regard, but it is curious that, you know, the, the Bill 148 uh, proposed changes do arise from the Changing Workplaces Review, and, and the increased minimum wage was not part of the, the focus of the, um, 
uh, of the uh, labor and employment uh, arbitrators that were conducting the review. Uh, we'll move on from there, and let's talk about, um, this is another fairly significant change, and that's um, under the heading of Equal Pay for Equal Work. Now, under the Employment Standards Act as it currently stands, um, and specifically Part 12, there is um, an existing rule around employers providing equal pay for equal, for equal work that's performed on the basis of, of sex only or gender. So essentially, as it currently reads, no employer shall pay an employee of one sex at a rate of pay less than the rate paid to an employee of the other sex. And then it goes on. So really, that, that rule exists currently, but it goes no farther than essentially ensuring that there's no pay discrepancies that are based on, on gender. And otherwise, as you know, is, has always been the case, employers operating in a non-unionized environment and where they don't have specific, specific rather, rules that might um, relate to a compensation pay, uh, compensation scheme or banding or those kinds of things where uh, pay rates are predictable, employers really have discretion with respect to how they set rates for employees, right? And there's no distinction with respect to how you pay your part-time, casual, and temporary employees in comparison with your full-time staff. So this is slated to change. So essentially, the Employment Standards Act is proposed to be amended by adding two new provisions. So first of all, there will be entitlement uh, to equal pay from an employer regardless of a difference in employment status, and also entitlement to equal pay for, an assi for assignment employees of a temporary help agency who performs substantially the same work, work as an employee of the temporary help agency's client. So temp employees, who real employer is the agency that has kind of deployed them to uh, work with a client, uh, they should not be paid based on their status differently than a full-time employee of that client that's performing substantially the same work. Uh, now, there will be exceptions to this rule. So essentially, uh, different pay rates will be permitted um, and based on status uh, where there's a seniority or merit system in place or a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production or output, or, and this is a general catch-all, any other factor other than sex or employment status. Okay, so there are exceptions. And what's notable here is that under the proposed changes, this will uh, grant an entitlement to part-time, casual, and temporary employees and temporary, and temporary help agency workers to request a review of their wages if they do not believe a party is be, a, a parity rather is being achieved, okay? Uh, and so that will add additional administrative work for an organization because responses to these requests must be in writing with the request denied, and there is a reprisal protection now baked into the reprisal provisions of the Employment Standards Act where these requests um, are being denied. Okay, and so, or where, where the requests are made and an employee, employer decides to retaliate against an employee, and that could be the part-time, temporary, or um, assignment employee that's making the request, or the employee that's providing the information pursuant to a request that's been made. So there's that reprisal protection, so they can't be, uh, receive any um, unfavorable treatment as a result of making the request. So significant change in that regard, and what we're going to do is we will focus on the implications when we look at kind of a, um, all the implications at the end of this section. Let's talk about employee scheduling rights. So currently, there are a few provisions in the Employment Standards Act uh, governing scheduling of employees, and uh, employers pretty much have broad discretion in scheduling employees. Uh, now. There is a, 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 a rule where the minimum three hours pay requirement exists, um, even if employees don't end up working full three hours. So for example, if an employee shows up for work, but their shift is canceled by an employer, 
the employee nonetheless must receive three hours pay. But this three hours pay it is at the minimum wage rate for each shift. So even if they're not required to work three hours. So there is that rule um, and, and that's how it currently stands. Now what's related to change is that the three hour rule will still apply only to employees who usually work more than three hours but then don't work the full three hours. Uh, now for on-call employees, for every 24 hour period an employee is on call, he or she will have to receive at least three hours pay at the regular wage rate, not the minimum wage rate, so at the regular wage rate, even if they are not called in or are called in for less than three hours. Now this will only apply if the employee was available to work for at least three hours at the relevant time. And it should be noted as well, there are uh, exceptions uh, to this rule, and that's where, the, where cir there are circumstances beyond the employer's control, they may not need to pay the three hours. So examples could be where there's a fire or power failure, or where the work is weather dependent and the employer cannot provide work for weather related reasons or other prescribed reasons. And when they talk about prescribed reasons, these prescribed <laughs> reasons would result from the, um, the regulations that will likely follow the enactment of uh, Bill 148. So there are some exceptions, but in this case, when it comes to scheduling, you can see that it could be potentially um, more costly for employers if they, if they aren't planful with respect to how they're scheduling their employees. Now, it's important to note that Employees will be entitled without fear of reprisal to refuse to accept a shift or be on call where the request is made with less than four days notice, except where the work is to deal with an emergency to remedy or reduce a public safety threat or for other prescribed reasons. Um, also note that request uh, changes to the hours of number of hours that they work. So there is the entitlement to request changes to the number of hours that employees work, their work days or their work location, provided that they've worked for the employer for at least three months. Okay, now the whole reference to without fear of reprisal means that the employer is not permitted to discipline or dismiss the employee because of the refusal to accept the shift on short notice or request changes to their job. Okay? And again, this whole um, request entitlement now, employers who receive a request for changes to schedule or work location must discuss with the employee and notify the employee of the employer's decision within a reasonable time after receiving it. And if the employer grants the request or any part of it, the notification must specify the date that the changes will take effect. If there's a denial to the request, the employer must include reasons and the employee must notify the employer of the refusal as soon as possible. So there's all kinds of rules now that are going to be instituted that didn't previously exist and which significantly encroach on uh, the employer's otherwise and, and conventional flexibility and discretion that they have when, uh, when scheduling. So employers that um, have particularly on-call employees um, or you know, schedule employees to work short duration shifts really need to take note of these changes. Vacation entitlements. This is a fairly straightforward one. As most of you know, currently under the Employment Standards Act, employees are entitled to two weeks of vacation time and 4% vacation pay per year. That's the minimum entitlement. And essentially, um, when I, one thing that we, I normally cover when I'm talking about uh, the Employment Standards Act is most of you will appreciate that the Employment Standards Act sets out, it's like the, the backbone of the employment relationship, essentially stipulating what the floor of entitlement, so the minimum entitlement that employees should have and kind of the minimum obligations employers have in the context of the employment relationship. It's, it's up to an employer to provide more than the minimums that are stipulated under the Employment Standards Act. And in that sense, the change as it relates to vacation entitlement may not impact uh, employers all that broadly because many employers do have a um, kind of an escalated entitlement, escalating entitlement um, as it relates to vacation entitlement. So um, 
in this case, now what's being codified in legislation is employees who have worked with the same, for the same employer for more than five years will be entitled to three weeks of paid vacation per year. And, uh, you know, just hearkening back to my comments I was making, a lot of em employers currently do that. So it's not un uncommon to see in an employee handbook or an employment contract that after five years of employment, an employee's uh, vacation entitlement will increase to three weeks. Um, this also comports and, and falls in line with other provincial jurisdictions that do have um, you know, vacation pay and vacation time increases after five years to three weeks, such as uh, British Columbia. So this may not be a huge um, disruption for certain uh, operations, but for those that stick to the minimums and there is no increase, you have to take note that after five years, and for those employees that have been there for five years or longer, their entitlement as of the turn of the year will be um, will be five three weeks rather. Okay. Let's talk about enhanced leave entitlements. This is a huge area uh, that is going to catch a lot of employers unprepared if they're not careful. So currently under the Employment Standards Act, there are ten unpaid leaves that have uh, protected reinstatement rights. So at the end of the leave, employees are entitled to return to the, the same job that they held pre-leave um, or to a position that is substantially similar to the to or comparable to the role that they had, unless there's some other non-leave related reason why that position would no longer exist when the employee returns. So with respect to leave enhancements, the ones that we're going to cover today um, really are going to be focusing on pregnancy and parental leave, personal emergency leave, and domestic or sexual violence leave. But you should note that there are other changes and specifically enhancements to other leaves under employment standards legislation, including family medical leave, uh, child death leave, uh, which is now a standalone leave and has been um, kind of decoupled from crime-related child disappearance leave. But those last three leaves that are on the slide, they also have been enhanced in duration um, in terms of um, employee entitlement. Let's first talk about uh, pregnancy and parental leave, the current landscape. So currently under the Employment Standards Act, um, as most of you know, there are two distinct uh, leave entitlements that could be used for the purposes of, of um, pregnancy or childbirth and, and um, caring for an infant. And that, that those relate to pregnancy and parental leave. And under pregnancy leave, employees who suffer a stillbirth or miscarriage currently may take up to six weeks of unpaid pregnancy leave after the pregnancy loss occurs. Now, with respect to parental leave, employees are, are eligible for an unpaid parental leave of 35 weeks where the employee took a pregnancy leave and 37 weeks for employees who did not. So let's now look at how Bill 148 uh, proposes to change this. So now with respect to the end of pregnancy leave, it should be noted that uh, where an employee is not entitled to take a parental leave as uh, along with a pregnancy leave, there's an extension from 6 to 12 weeks after a pregnancy loss in the event of a miscarriage or stillbirth. So that there's been an enhancement in the duration of entitlement with respect to the end of pregnancy leave on those conditions. Now, when parental leave may begin has been extended from 52 to 78 weeks after the child is born or becomes in the, the, into custody or care. And parental leave entitlement has also been expanded from 35 to 61 weeks for employees who took a pregnancy leave and from 37 to 63 weeks for employees who did not take a pregnancy leave. So essentially, the combined duration of pregnancy and parental leave taken by employees as, as of uh, next year will be up to 18 months. Okay, So that's going to be a significant increase from what it currently stands, which is essentially a year for employees who take pregnancy and parental leave. With respect to personal emergency leave, this is going to be um, a significant area of change for a number of employers, and here's why. As it stands, employers with 50 or more employees must provide 10 unpaid personal emergency leave days, 
Now, these days can be used in the event of injury, illness, or medical emergency experienced by the employee, or death, injury, illness, or urgent matter involving certain family members. Now, what's slated to change is that all employees will be eligible or entitled to personal emergency leave days, not just those working for employees who employ, employers rather who employ more than 50 employees. So for small, medium-sized companies you know, that don't meet that 50 employee threshold any longer, that doesn't matter. All employees will have this personal emergency leave entitlement. Now, what's even more, um, I guess, will be onerous for certain employers is that two of the 10 personal emergency leave days will be paid leave days. Now, employees must have worked for an employer for more than one week before being entitled to the two paid leave, leave days off, but if you have a new employee that requires personal emergency leave time in the first week, uh, that doesn't mean they won't be eligible for any time, they just have to take unpaid time in the first week. Now, this is another really significant uh, change that's being instituted, and that employers will not be permitted, in fact, will be prohibited from demanding medical notes to justify uh, leaves taken under the personal emergency leave uh, entitlement. On a so, webinar, this is wild. This is Bill 148. So, Unbelievable. So if somebody just isn't muted, that's all right. Everybody. Um, yeah. I'll, so be, I'll be with you as soon as this is done. Employers will not be permitted to demand a medical note to justify the absence. So I was just mentioning that that is absolutely something that's going to have huge impact on a lot of workplaces. Now, there is a new leave, so the leaves will be increased to 11 once Bill 148 hits, and that's this new domestic or sexual violence leave. Now, under this leave, essentially, um, the purpose is to seek legal or law enforcement assistance, including preparing for or participating in any civil or criminal legal proceeding related to or resulting from the domestic or sexual violence. That's one of the aims of Obtain services from a victim services organization, to obtain psychological or other professional counseling, to relocate temporarily or permanently, and to seek legal or law enforcement assistance. Now, in large message, and sorry, in large measure, the reason why we have um, days entitlements, so you have 10 days as opposed to the entitlement cast in weeks, so the 15 weeks is because it's recognized under the section, as I said earlier, that there might be a day here, a day there that employees may require for the purposes of having to take, um, you know, to, to do court appearances, uh, maybe to move, uh, maybe to seek certain types of assistance. So in, those, in that case, uh, employees have the days available as opposed to having to take them to leave in, in weeks. And I know that there are probably a number of questions that uh, are being posed. I can't, um, it may be that what we can do at the end, close to the end, because I can't see the questions, is perhaps we can have uh, our moderator read out the questions, certain of the questions, and I can answer the questions as we get uh, towards the end. But what I'll do is I'll keep charging forward to make sure that we cover the content and with the intention of leaving some time at the end for us to have questions. Okay, another area of change relates to the misclassification of employees. And what I'm going to focus on um, under this heading is where employee contra or contractors um, are being misclassified and, and really the focus is where they're being classified in a manner that they avoid being treated as employees when uh, the individuals are truly in an employment relationship with an employer. So as it stands, um, with respect to the current landscape, it should be noted that independent contractors are estimated to account for approximately 12% of the active workforce in Ontario. Now, it's been kind of 
insisted by the Ministry of Labor and other labor activists that this number is inflated by employers who misclassify employees as independent contractors to escape obligations, including those under the Employment Standards Act. So the changes that will be instituted uh, as if and when, likely, Bill 148 comes into effect is that employers will be expressly prohibited from treating employees as though they are not employees for the purposes of the ESA. Now, in the event of the dispute, it should be noted that the onus will be on the company to prove that the worker is not, in fact, an employee for the purposes of the ESA. So prior to Bill 148 and as it currently exists, the ESA doesn't really tackle the misclassification of employees, apart from the fact that if you have an, a dispute with uh, a, an individual uh, who, you know, may at some point claim that they're an employee rather than being an independent contractor. If they can prove this at the Ministry of Labor, then they'll fall within the the, the Employment Standards Act entitlements and provisions. Um, but uh, barring that, there isn't anything specifically that relates to or governs misclassification of independent contractors. And now. This will be a focus and there will be penalties and sanctions where employers do not get the relationship right. Now let's quickly talk about the, labor, the, the proposed amendments to the labor relations legislation. First one I want to cover with you today um, relates to the union, union access to employee list. Now for those of you that are in unionized operations or if you've ever been in a um, an organization that has uh, been the subject of a union organizing drive, you'll know that accurate information about the group of employees that a union is seeking to represent is critical to the success of a union organizing drive, meaning this is the activity that the union engages in to try to garner support so that it can file an application to the Labor Relations Board uh, to be certified as the representative of the employees in an employer employees a group of employees called the bargaining unit at an employer operation. So as it currently stands, employers are not required to provide the union leaders with employee lists. Only the Ontario Labor Relations Board has a full list of employees and the voter list when the application for certification is filed. So the union is part of its union organizing campaign, part of the its mission is to determine who the employees are within the group of employees that it seeks to represent. And this is unassisted by the Labour Board and certainly not by the employer. Now with respect to the Bill 148 proposed changes, now the union is able to apply to the Ontario Labour Relations Board for orders directing the employer to provide employee lists. Now in order to be um, eligible for disclosure of the employee list, the union will have to demonstrate to the Ontario Labor Relations Board that it has at least 20% of the employees in the group of employees it seeks to represent as union members. Usually, This is usually demonstrated by signed um, union cards. Now, it, it will only apply to, to workplaces where no union has been certified. And the union has to provide a description of the proposed bargaining unit or the group of employees it wishes to represent and again, evidence of membership to the Ontario Labor Relations Board with its application for disclosure of the employee list. Now, the rules here will be that the employer has two days to provide the, the Labor Board with notice of disagreement with proposed, the proposed bargaining unit or the number of employees in the bargaining unit. But where there's been no disagreement and 20% or more of the individuals in the union appear to be members of the union, the OLRB, that's the Labor Board, will direct the employer to provide the list of employees to the union. So what will the union get? The union will receive, if its application is successful, employee names, employees' phone numbers, and employees' email addresses. Now, the, it's already been predetermined that in Ontario, this disclosure complies with uh, relevant privacy legislation, so an employer can't say that it's not going to disclose the list because of its uh, employee's privacy rights. However, the union is restricted to using the information obtained only for the purposes of establishing bargaining rights. Now, final change I want to discuss with you with respect to um, what is slated to be um, amended to the Labor Relations Act is remedial certification. Quickly, as it stands currently, when an employer breaches the Labor Relations Act, 
and this is resulting in the union failing to certify through the vote process or secure 40% support to attain a vote, the Labor Relations Board has the option to order a representation vote, and it could be a further vote, and grant a variety of other remedies. So essentially how this usually manifests is the employer in its conduct uh, may be facing allegations by the union that it either threatened, coerced, or intimidated employees who would, have, would fall in the group that the uh, union is seeking to represent. So and that's called an unfair labor practice. So um, if the union files an unfair labor practice against the employer, um, then the, the Labor Relations Board has the discretion, again, to grant a number of remedies to repair any harm that the union experienced as a result of the employer's conduct. And there also is the discretion, and this is considered to be a very extreme remedy, to certify a union without a vote only if no other remedy is sufficient. And how this is uh, slated to change is that remedial certification will be an automatic remedy where an employer contravenes the Labor Relations Act such that 40% support was not obtained by the union or the representation vote likely did not reflect the union's true wishes. So again, just really quickly, why that 40% um, is such a critical number for the union is because you need to obtain if you're a union seeking to unionize a group of employees working for an employer, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've attained 40% membership support in order to be eligible to file the application for certification. So if the employer has misconducted itself to interfere with the union genuinely being able to kind of garner that support, then there are remedies that could be imposed. Um, and again, even if there is a 40% threshold that is met and the application is filed, there could be conduct that's alleged that the employer engaged in that skewed the vote and so the employee's true wishes were not determined. So now, as opposed to this being a discretionary extreme remedy that's very infrequently imposed and that's automatic certification, now this will be an automatic remedy. So they, there could be um, automatic or remedial certification that's imposed. So this is huge from a labor relations perspective, and a number of the uh, labor relations act uh, amendments that are um, kind of going to flow from Bill 148 will make it easier for unions to certify. So that definitely is something that should be taken into account. Now, really quickly, because I know we're getting short on time, I want to go through some of the, the implications for employers. I'm going, going through this at fairly rapid pace because of the time that we have left. But you should note the following as an employer, that with respect to the minimum wage increase, there's a, a lot of employers are focusing on only the required uh, increases where that two wages that will result from the amendments where they employ minimum wage labor. But you should bear in mind that if min the minimum wage rate is going to increase, your other employ employees in your work workplace will likely expect commensurate wage increases. So you're now $15 an hour employee that is making you know, a fair bit more than the minimum wage rate being 1160 will likely expect, you know, come January 1, 2019, to not be at a $15 rate because they don't consider themselves to be a minimum wage employee. So employers need to anticipate that not only will the minimum wage employees receive a, a, an, an increase, but there will be expected wage increases. And that you've got to really consider that because, again, attracting good talent to an organization is challenging for many employers these days. So you have to, you know, make sure that you maintain competitiveness in all areas and attractiveness in all areas, including your, what you pay your employees. Now, there's going to be a loss of flexibility and discretion in how employees of different statuses are paid, as I mentioned earlier. This flexibility and discretion, in uh, particularly in non-unionized environments was something that employers had and, in, and, and could use um, and, and, and as they indiscriminately. But now there's going to be um, you know, regulation around uh, whether or not you're paying your part-time, your temporary employees, or employees of temporary agencies um, you know, equivalently to those that are in full-time positions doing substantially the same work. So there's a number of strategies that will be available based on the exceptions that are um, set out in the proposed legislation and we'll cover them in a moment. 
Now, loss of incentive to use temporary employees because uh, in temporary employees, if they are now going to be eligible to be paid at higher wage rates, um, because you know if they're being compared to full-time employees perfor performing the same work in an establishment, and that will make the temporary help uh, that is uh, often used by employers to you know deal with various business demands, and seasonality, etc. That, that's going to cost more likely. So um, there may be a loss of incentive. Um, but there's also a loss of flexibility and discretion in how employees are scheduled, and I touched on that earlier when we, we covered that proposed change. Um, increased costs if employers are un unable to confirm schedules in advance. So because there are now stipulated um, notice periods uh, and that employees need to be um, receiving in advance of any change to a scheduled shift um, in certain con under certain conditions, uh, employers will be required to pay out sums at employees' regular wage rate for the th based on the three-hour rule. So now it could be costly for employees, employers where they are not mindful and intentional of how they're scheduling employees. Also, there's going to be enhanced administrative requirements with respect to having to provide reasons in writing to employees related to certain decisions as they relate to scheduling, um, request and change of work location, um, and also with respect to equal pay for equal work based on employee status. Absence management issues related to increased leave entitlements, uh, that's going to be very, a huge challenge for a number of employers. Um, right now it's difficult already where you have leaves uh, that need to be filled or vacancies that need to be filled on a temporary basis. Um, and now because the leave durations are increasing, you know, your kind of offboarding to leave and onboarding back from leave and what you do in terms of keeping the talent pipeline flowing is going to have to be very, very strategic on your part. Um, restrictions related to when employers may request medical notes to justify absences. So now again, where you have two paid uh, leave days under personal emergency leave entitlement um, and you can't ask for medical justification for those two, two leave days, um, employers are going to have to be really mindful about when they request information, in, uh, medical information rather, to justify leave. Increased costs related to additional paid leaves and entitlements. So, of course, uh, managing leaves and managing the costs related to leaves, including, you know, the costs that you may have to incur related to even overtime if you're unable to, uh, you know, fill uh, positions that are... Um, uh, that are absent or vacant be, because of leaves. This is something that has to be borne in mind. Uh, there's going to be a whole impact on the viability of temporary help agencies as a result of some of the new amendments to the Employment Standards Act that we've discussed. And it's going to be easier for unions to gain bargaining rights given some of the, uh, the changes that are going to be made to the Labor Relations Act as we discussed. So I have here 10 key strategies and best practices to meet compliance obligations. Again, Given the time that we have, I'm going to whiz through these pretty quickly because I do want to give um, some time for questions. I am prepared to stay on for you know, a few minutes beyond our end time of 11 o'clock, if that's okay, um, just to make sure that some of the questions are answered. So really quickly, at the very base level, you have to ensure that your organization is familiarized with the proposed changes and start considering the impact on your operations as early as possible. You know, there are a number of significant impacts that employers are going to have to recalibrate how they operate to ensure that they're not going to be you know, encountering costs and disruptions that um, they didn't otherwise anticipate. So understanding the impact of, and implications of the, the, the legislation on your operation is going to be important. There should be an audit of your existing policies and practices for compliance and gaps should be identified and addressed. Um, you want to review and consider new entitlements to ensure you're not unintentionally providing a greater right or benefit. As I mentioned, the Employment Standards Act requirements and obligations that employers have only represent minimums. There's specific provision in the legislation that it makes it clear that employers can confer a greater right or benefit for employees. And if that is the case, um, you, you know, you want to make sure that certain of your entitlements that you're providing aren't going beyond what you intend. So let's say, for example, you have personal days, five personal days that you grant, and organizations have to realize that with two paid days 
um, now being part of personal emergency leave, that you could be offering seven unwittingly. So you've got to make sure that you carefully word the entitlements uh, that you're providing if you intend on keeping to a certain threshold. You should be transparent about pay and compensation programs that could give rise to pay differences based on employee status. So if you do have seniority or length of service or merit that um, really determines and, and could be the basis for any discrepancy in how employees are paid, then you should communicate that because that could you could fall within the exception then where you have part-time, temporary or temporary help employees who are being paid differently than their full-time counterparts. Um, ensure contractors are not improperly classified, so really look at your independent contractors and ensure that they truly are in arm's length relationships with your organization, otherwise you could be facing sanctions under the Employment Standards Act. Clearly communicate when an employer may request medical notes to justify absences. I just made some comments on that, noting that the two paid emergency leave days you can't ask for justification for, but you could have in your policies that there is a threshold number of days beyond those two days that where you will require medical justification. The other thing to bear in mind is where an employee may need to demonstrate that they're fit to perform their, their, their work based on any health and safety concern or hazards that they could present if they return to work unfit, I don't believe that this legislation in any way is going to preclude an employer's right to ask for um, fitness to return to work medical notes, so you should bear that in mind. Um, you want to review your, your organization's recruitment strategies to ensure temporary absences resulting from leaves can be met. So again, you want to make sure that you're, you've got the, the pipeline full, um, or at least you've got some type of uh, sourcing strategy so that you can fill leaves and vacancies if they arise. Uh, intentionally consider strategies if you wish to stay union free. Um, that's something that really a lot of organizations need to focus on now that unionization will be made easier after Bill 148 is in effect. Train all people managers and hold them accountable for enforcing policies consistency, consistently. And one strategy is to standardize processes uh, to assist managers that may face, you know, your frontline management. They're the ones that may face uh, requests for change in work location or change in hours or, or the you know, basis of their pay. You want to make sure that you've got standardized forms or some systems in place to address this to make it easier. And finally, you should create a communication strategy to roll out new policies and procedures. You want to incorporate, you want to incorporate how this is a, can be a win. So where you can claim some wins or where you're conferring um, something that is an, a benefit uh, for employees that may be beyond uh, what is stipulated under the new um, requirements, you want to claim that as an employer. So um, certainly you want to make sure that there's a communication strategy to roll out new policies and procedures so it's understood where the changes are coming from and why they're necessary to be made. So with that, we've made it to the end of the presentation. What I will do, there are some questions uh, I'm happy to, to field them now. I can't read them, just so Gail, if you're able to jump in. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, if everyone could just make sure that your mics are muted um, so that Laura has full, full audio control and that everybody gets the benefit of hearing what Laura has to say um, with regards to these questions, that'd be terrific. So Laura, the first question that came in uh, was, do the changes to scheduling apply to overtime shifts? For instance, what if an overtime shift is canceled within uh, less than two days notice? The legislation, the changes aren't specific. Um, certainly if it's overtime that is connected to uh, on call, uh, an employee that's on call, I would say based on the wording of the legislation as it stands, that it could definitely fall within the changes when they're implemented. Okay, terrific. Um, the second question, um, will a note not be able to be requested for only the two days now paid, um, sorry, um, now paid um, or for all 10 days 
Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if that was clear, Laura. I can repeat it. No, it is clear. It is clear. Oh. So essentially, oh. if I understand the question, um, is this kind of prohibition on getting a medical note to justify an absence, will it relate only to the two paid days or to the entire 10 day? 10-day entitlement, including the eight unpaid days, and yes, it's clear that it's not only restricted to the two paid, day, paid days. We anticipate it applies to the full 10-day 10, 10 allotment. Okay, terrific. Um, so um, the next question is um, the 10 emergency leave entitlement. When an employee states the reason for their absence to be medical in nature, when would it be considered appropriate to request medical documentation? Well, again, when it relates to the uh, 10 personal emergency leave days, there is pretty much a blanket prohib prohibition from asking for um, medical justification. As I said, though, if somebody is off, and let's say the nature of their um, condition would call into question whether or not they can safely perform their work, particularly if the operation is a safety sensitive operation, then that doesn't bar, in my mind, at this stage, an employer's right to request for medical justifying um, or proving fitness to return to work, because that's a whole health and safety consideration. But certainly with respect to um, the, if it's a 10 personal emergency leave days, there's a prohibition for asking for medical to justify the absence. But if, they, if you have additional leave days over and above, or time that might be taken beyond the 10 days, uh, then you can ask for medical justification. Just those 10 days are protected from that request. Okay. Um, this next question comes from someone who um, owns a childcare center. And um, what they're wondering is, in terms of vacation pay, their uh, child care center closes for two weeks at Christmas and again at March break. And they would like to know if they're required to pay their employee, uh, those who have been there um, over five years, um, vacation pay during, that during those times. Well, they're still employees. So even where you have employees who may be on inactive in service due to being uh, on leave, uh, they're still going to be considered to be accruing length of service for the purposes of calculating vacation entitlement and other entitlements. So certainly that, you know, when they're off, when they're on vacation leaves, et cetera, that still inc is included in the calculation of length of service. So if they're over five years in total, then there will be that increased vacation entitlement. Okay. Um... The next question is, um, this next person wants to know if these changes are applicable to salaried employees as well. Um, would these changes affect a salaried employee or is this just um, in particular for those who um, are paid uh, by a wage? That's a great question and the reason being is because there is this commonly held belief and it's a, it's a misguided belief, a misunderstood um, belief that um, you know, salaried employees under the Employment Standards Act are treated differently than, than hourly employees. And where this creates a risk for employers is a lot of employers don't, uh, don't afford entitlement such as overtime entitlement um, or apply restrictions to hours of work to salaried employees. And that's not the case. It doesn't, the, the Employment Standards Act makes no distinction between salary and hourly employees. And in fact, you know, when I've gone, been at the Ministry of Labor and, uh, you know, we've had employees that are on a salaried basis, the, the Ministry of Labor just applies a calculation to convert them to an hourly rate for the purposes of overtime entitlement. And usually it's not in the employer's favor, frankly, when that conversion is done. So it's really important to know the hourly value of your salaried employees, but also make sure that you're not just paying them on the basis of salary, not taking into consideration whether or not they're entitled to other overtime, for example, based on the hours of work that they're working. So in short, yes, this applies to both salary and hourly employees. Okay. So um, just two more questions. Um, the next question is, uh, can a note be requested for the balance of the eight days of emergency leave? So we kind of covered that. And by the way, I want to go back to the, uh, the salary versus hourly 
uh, comments I just made. Just as one distinction, if your salaried employees are managerial employees or if they fall under another exclusion, then you know it, it, it may be that they're not going to be entitled or certain of the changes won't impact them, like overtime entitlement, for example, but that's the only qualification. So I think with respect to just going to this question you just asked, it's the same one. I think it's probably there are a number of questions with respect to the medical note restriction. And yes, the, the medical note restriction applies to the eight unpaid days as well. Okay, last question. Um, last question is with regards to parental or pregnancy leave. Um, yeah. This person wanted to know, um, um, is 18 months um, only for federal employees or is this something that applies to all? Well, okay, no, no, so we're talking about all the changes apply to uh, Ontario regulated employees and employers with the exception of minimum wage, which the minimum wage will apply to federally regulated employers as well, so those rates will apply. But all the changes, though, because this is provincial legislation, we're talking about the Ontario Employment Standards Act and the um, Ontario Labor Relations Act, that these changes will just apply to uh, uh, Ontario-based employers. Okay? Okay. That's so, terrific. So there's, there's just one thing I want to just close out with, just with respect to when the changes are slated to be implemented. So just note that as of January 1, 2018, that's when you'll see the $14 per hour uh, increase to minimum wage, vacation pay uh, increase will be instituted, personal emergency leave changes will be instituted, the equal pay for equal work changes will be um, implemented as it stands now, April 1, 2018, and then January 1, 2019, that's when we have the $15 per hour minimum wage, location change requests will come into effect, minimum three hours pay change will come into effect and refusal of shifts when less than four days notice that's going to come into effect at that time so there is a bit of a phased implementation to the changes and all you should note though that all labor relations act provisions including those that we discussed with respect to union certification um, will occur six months after royal assent is um, has been attained so that's the schedule with respect to how the changes will be implemented. But I will say just in closing that you really need to keep your ear to the ground. Um, right now the bill is back at second reading and is being debated and there could be some further changes that come down the pike, um, hopefully some clawback with respect to some of the, um, the costly um, impacts on employers. But um, certainly keep, your, keep yourself um, kind of apprised with what's going on. Our firm has a newsletter that details all the changes. If, if anyone would like to get a copy of the newsletter, perhaps they can coordinate through you, Gail. I can send it to you electronically and you can send it out to those that might have interest and want to dive a little more deeply into the proposed changes. That would be terrific. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Laura, and again, and thank you, everyone. That's all the time we have um, for our webinar today. Um, we ask that you just take a few minutes to answer today's exit survey, which will be sent to you shortly, and let us know how, can, how we can improve, and also what topics um, would be of interest to you in the future. Also, we'll be sending a uh, follow-up email that will alert you to the on-demand status of today's event so that you can review any material you may have missed or simply go over it again. For more local, relevant, and timely labor market information, be sure to wis visit our sister website, www.workinginpeelhalton.com. On behalf of myself, Laura, and the entire team at Peel Halton Local Employment Planning Council, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. It was, a it was a pleasure spending this time with you. I hope this information was very informative, and I wish you all have a great day. Bye, everyone. Yes. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.